Hi and welcome, it's Jessica Drummond here from the Integrative Women's Health Institute. And I'm here today to walk you through my step-by-step -step process for doing an assessment for a client or patient who has chronic pelvic pain. Now, this will work in general for any chronic pain assessment, and I think you'll see that when we take this holistic approach, it's gonna take some time. We may not be able to do this in just one you know, evaluation or assessment session. This is an ongoing process and really perspective on how to address chronic pain from a holistic perspective as a professional. So I'm really talking today to professionals, to physical therapists, midwives, nutritionists, occupational therapists, physicians, naturopaths, chiropractors, any profession, acupuncturists, and you know, some in our training have more of this holistic approach than others, but also for patients and women dealing with chronic pain. This is what you want to look for when you are working with a practitioner that they see you as a very holistic whole person. Now, any one practitioner may not be able to do all of these things given time constraints, insurance constraints, uh, licensure constraints. It may be that your team is collaboratively looking at you holistically. And similarly, if you are a practitioner, feel that you don't feel necessarily that you have to do all of this and you have to do it in one session in seven minutes. That's impossible, but it is a perspective on how you're approaching each of your complex your patients with complex chronic pelvic or any chronic pain conditions. Because really this holistic mindset is challenging because as you learn all of these different pieces, it's hard to know how to create a systematic approach so that you're addressing everything with each client and making sure you're not missing things while not getting too far off uh, on tangent. So I always start with, and, and this is again, kind of the focus today is gonna to be approaching chronic pelvic pain conditions, but know that if someone has shoulder pain or chronic headaches or chronic hip pain, it's a very similar issue. But if specifically today, what we'll be talking about is vulvodynia, interstitial cystitis, chronic pain conditions in general, like fibromyalgia, endometriosis, adenomyosis, constipation, IBS, uh, and chronic fatigue often goes along with this picture. All right, so we always start by opening the session with mindful listening. Now, as a practitioner, you are a human and you have tons of things on your plate. You're, you know, my 13 year old forgot her lunch today. So do I do that? Do I, do I bring her lunch or not? You know, uh, my husband's traveling, one of your parents might be having issues. You know, you have a lot of things going on in your life that you may or may not bring in with you to the session with your client or patient. So my suggestion is prior to meeting with each patient, you have a small ritual. One of the easiest things to do if you're working in a hospital or clinical practice is to stop, wash your hands, which you've got to do anyway, and use that as a moment of a few mindful breaths. That's where you can bring your attention, letting go of your outside life, letting go, and, and I'm talking about mindfully, letting go of your outside life, letting go of the client or patient you just worked with, letting go of any office politics, and just bringing your attention back to yourself, grounding yourself through your feet, and thus when you walk into the room or get on the phone with your next client or patient, you are fully present. So have a ritual, washing your hands, closing all the windows on your computer. Uh, maybe when you open the treatment room door, that's when you begin to ground yourself. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to take a lot of time, but it's about, about a mindset shift to being in the room, whether that's a virtual room or a physical room with your client or patient. So. Then you want to give, create, what you want to imagine is that there is a box of space between you and your client that is a safe space for them to tell their story. You're not judging their story. 
you're not coming up with pattern recognition of what to do next. Oh yes, I've seen this a million times before, here's what we're gonna do next. You're just holding space, almost literally, for that client to safely tell her story. And that could be the first time she's meeting you, that could be the hundredth time she's meeting you, and she's telling the story of what happened since your last meeting. Uh, if you're able to patiently and mindfully, without judgment, listen and know that your mind will get distracted you just keep redirecting it listen to her story often some key things will come to light she will bring your attention to the things that are most important so give it a good five to seven or eight minutes that might seem like a lot of time when you're just sitting there but you can just practice this today on any and all of your patients or clients and also on your family when your partner or your children come home today or you come home and meet them, mindfully listen, imagine a safe space, tell me about your day. No judgment, no response, no advice, just listening. And you will find that often that builds trust and the ability for that patient, client, or friend or family member to go deeper, faster, and get to some of the real hearts of the issue. Sometimes they're very physical, sometimes they're very emotional, sometimes they have to do with other people. You know, there are many reasons that people have chronic pain and we need to tease out what it is for each client. So that safe, mindful listening space is essential. Then, well, and then after that safe space, three, five, seven minutes, you can reflect back the story that you heard. Oh, it sounds to me like when you first started having yeast infections, they went away with the first couple of treatments, but after that, they began to uh, not go away, even with treatment, even when you had the, 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 vaginal, the vagina, vaginal canal cultured, nothing showed up, or something showed up, but it was different every time, so, and, and yet you still had the symptoms. So you, you're essentially reflecting to her that you heard the crux of the issue, or maybe so this all began when you got divorced. This all began when you got in that car accident. This all began when you lost your last job and you've been a little bit fumbling since then because of the physical pain, it's hard to get a new job, and because that last job loss was so hard on you. And just reflecting back exactly what they're saying, uh, not, not judging it, not, you know, just, hearing it. Then I always recommend, and you can do this for yourself, uh, again, use it with your next couple of patients, literally take a piece of paper, you know, starting with kind of birth and going to the current moment and actually even a little bit before birth. So if here's birth, you want to have a client, your client document how her health was you know, in childhood and teenage years, currently a lot of ear infections and antibiotics, or maybe mom smoked, or maybe dad, um, maybe dad got sick, you know, during the pregnancy. Anything could happen, could have happened. Uh, maybe a car accident in the teen years, and then a few other things happened, and then a few quiet years, and then, oh, maybe a big move, and then a few other health issues spiked. It's very helpful to see where in her, the course of her life was, were there these quiet, healthy years, or at least years where she felt okay, and where there might have been an issue. I call that the break in her health, where all of a sudden, you know, there are 10 or, or 5 or 8 or 12 health issues that come up at the same time, the pelvic pain, headaches, skin breakouts, you know, a lot of times these things don't happen in isolation. And so we start to look at, well, what was that little break? What was going on here? Was it a divorce, a breakup, a death, a new relationship, um, a big trip, uh, a car accident, a, uh, an infection, you know, or, a, or maybe a birth? Uh, that might have re-triggered something. You know, there are so many reasons that our health shifts and it, it can happen several times throughout life. And so we look at what are the predisposing factors, what are the breaks, and just get a broader picture of 
what mind, body, and spirit things may be, um, may be contributing here. It's just clues. Then do a, a complete medical history. So you want to know what medication she's on, supplements, dietary supplements exactly, and doses, and you know what is her current food plan. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit more in a minute, but current food plan, I, I do consider as part of the medical history, particularly if you're a nutritionist or a physical therapist, naturopath, someone who's trained with using nutrition in your practice, uh, medicine, midwifery, uh, any surgical history, any current treatment, any current medications, current you know surgeries preparing for, uh, maybe a long-standing chronic illness that is being currently managed. What's going on there? So get that information. Just you know, again, we're information gathering. This is an assessment. Then a physical evaluation. Again, if you have, if you are licensed to touch your clients, and even if you're a nutritionist and not licensed to touch your clients, you can be looking, kind of observing, are the, are the nails strong and healthy looking? Are the eyes white and clear? How is the skin looking? You know, are there kind of bumps on the back of the arm? Is the skin very dry? Those are some physical signs that the client may be omega-3 fatty acid deficiency. So we can use our, our nutrition focused physical exam. We can also, if we're physical therapists, chiropractors, acupuncturists, using our own style of musculoskeletal exam and not just looking at where the isolated issue is. Here in this case, the pelvis or the pelvic floor or the vulva, but also the hips, the spine, the abdomen. You know, she have a C-section scar or an, you know, an uh, endometriosis uh, surgical scar, an appendix removed. Was it traumatic or was it more um, controlled? You know, a knee surgery. How are her feet, ankles, knees? What's the alignment of her spine? Does she feel very comfortable standing in her body? Or are there places that are kind of guarded or old injuries that, you know, she really hasn't awakened uh, in a long time? So just notice how she inhabits her body from a spiritual perspective. Is she very in her head thinking, you know, does she have a very in her brain kind of job, you know, a lot of facts and figures, or is she really able to kind of spiritually and emotionally also inhabit her complete body? Is she able to do that except maybe her pelvis where she might not feel comfortable? Or is she able to inhabit except kind of her shoulder, which is guarded or her, her neck, you know, so it's different for each client. And you want to think of this again, holistically, don't just immediately drill down into what's the tissue doing right in the vulva vaginal canal, or if the, if the patient's presenting for, with vulvodynia, for example. Um, and, and then, of course, if we are dealing with a pelvic pain condition, a pelvic exam. How are her pelvic floor muscles? What does the tissue look like vulva vaginally? Is it pink and perfused? Does she have plenty of blood flow? Or is there a lot of tightness? Uh, and white, you know, if you've been walking around like this for years, right, your fingers get white and the blood flow isn't there versus if there's flow to the tissue or, there, or is there scarring? Was there traumatic birth, a surgery? Um, you know, what is going on that may be blocking some lymphatic flow, circulation, and also energetic flow? And then are there tightnesses in the muscles? Are there tightnesses in the internal? pelvic floor and hip, you know, things like obturator internus and piriformis and the muscles of around the sacrum internally that we need to pay attention to. And again, externally as well, how's the mobility of the fascia, the skin, the viscera. Um, then we look at laboratory data. So this is where we want to consider our systems approach, right? So the musculoskeletal system is what we're is partially what we're looking at the physical eval. We're also looking at the integumentary system, skin, nails, hair. You know, is she losing a lot of hair? That could be a sign of iron deficiency or um, or thyroid issues. If she's always cold, so we're looking more at integumentary system, circulation, nervous system, lymphatic system musculoskeletal system when we're looking at that physical exam 
and then uh, on the laboratory and also some of the history we can look at the the um, gastrointestinal system so how is her digestive function is she chewing when she eats does she have heartburn or bloating how does her stomach feel when she eats does she have adequate acidity and then what's the gut microbial environment is she able to absorb nutrients or is her small intestine having some issues such as increased intestinal permeability maybe caused by food sensitivities or related to food sensitivities or stress or other hormonal uh, shifts. So we look at, is she absorbing nutrients on the urinary organic acids test? Are there uh, imbalances in the bacterial environment in the gastrointestinal system that are raising some of these markers? We've got more pathogenic bacteria in there, which could be a sign of small intestinal bacterial or fungal overgrowth or large intestine bacterial or fungal overgrowth. Stool testing will help differentiate whether it's small or large, as will SIBO breath testing. And so we're looking at the gastrointestinal system through some of this laboratory and history data, and we're looking at the hormonal system, again, with history. Is your pain cyclical? Do you have painful periods? For men, they have a daily cycle. Is there a, is there a time during the day when their pelvic pain is worse? Um, you know, did it change with pregnancy? Did it change with puberty? Did it change with perimenopause? And we can use Dutch hormone testing to get a, a more complete picture. So we can look at the sex hormone uh, flows and cyclical rhythms. We can also look at stress hormone systems. So cortisol, melatonin, insulin, do they feel, you know, is their blood sugar unstable? We've talked a lot about that. You can look at some past videos to look at some of the blood sugar instability issues. Um, a lot of that will show up in more hormonal tests and history focus. Um, and then, you know, if this has been a long-standing issue or seemed to have been triggered by something where they also had a infectious issue or environmental toxin exposure maybe they you know got a bunch of fillings out or had a bunch of fillings put in or suddenly moved somewhere they were where they were eating sushi all the time and you know maybe they have a heavy metal overload so again going back to where are the breaks in her health is going to be really helpful to see what else was going on was there a toxic exposure did you all of a sudden start coloring your hair all the time or getting your nails done or have a new baby and paint the whole house right so look at those in uh, toxic exposures around the times where health may have broken and there are laboratory tests to look at that but you can also just use questionnaires and look at the timeline all right so we've gathered all of this information and what's really important is to be talking to the client throughout and saying look this is a process there are so many layers here that may be involved and we may not go after all of these layers at once we'll get to that in a minute but as over time as we gather this data we can begin to see what's most important generally from a kind of scientific perspective but also what's most important and easiest for you to change all right so Number six, and I'm gonna hop a little bit in front of here. Uh, foundation, does this client have a solid foundation of her health? Is she sleeping eight hours a night? Or is she playing, you know, on Facebook until midnight? Or watching television until midnight? Or, you know, eating chocolate cake until midnight, right? Who knows? Um, is she exercising really late at night and then can't fall asleep? Is she groggy when she wakes up in the morning? Um, what are some of the things we can do around sleep? Sometimes it's the pain, it's the nighttime urination that makes sleep challenging, but I would challenge you to find out, even if that is the case, how can we also optimize sleep hygiene, cortisol and melatonin levels, um, blue light, EMF, and other kinds of environmental toxin exposure? Let's pay attention to that so we can optimize sleep within the context. Maybe reduce the night awakenings, you know, from every two to three hours to uh, two or three times a night, complete, you know? Movement, is this client, you know, does she have a movement practice at all? Any ability to do some consistent walking, to just be outside in nature? Um, it doesn't have to be a hardcore exercise program, but 
just what is she feel like she's able to move. Sometimes pushing too much exercise too soon is not ideal, but is there any movement going on? And support. This is a huge one because I think when people have, I know, when people have chronic pain and particularly chronic pelvic pain, there's an isolating quality to that. And you know, it may be difficult to have intimate partner relationships. It may be difficult, you know, there's infertility that can go along with this. So human support is not to be underestimated. And I mean the basics, friendship, quality family relationships, you know, maybe it's not a time where a woman can pursue a romantic relationship right in the middle of chronic pelvic pain, but it might be because there are humans, men and women who are struggling with chronic pain, who just need connection and maybe some small connections. It doesn't have to be about sex. It can be about walking around a museum. It can be about, you know, meeting for lunch or dinner or water, you know, it, we have to support our clients to build a community. It might be one person at a time. It might be one hour at a time, whatever they can tolerate. Um, but building some connections and starting with those that the client feels the safest with, because when we feel safe, when our brain has messages of safety, it can relax. And that is key to healing. So support, I really believe, is not to be underestimated. This foundation has to be in place for all of the detail. You know, we can throw all kinds of um, antimicrobial herbs at SIBO and complex probiotic supplements, and we can do very specific uh, pelvic floor manual therapies. But if our client is lacking a, a foundation of health, sleep, support from one person, from one hour a week, um, movement, being in nature, even if that simply means sitting outside on their porch, again, one hour a week, half hour a week. We have to, what I call, like grow the kinks in the armor. So the other big thing that I wanna mention, and this is probably the most important thing in this whole conversation this morning, we have to sh help shift our own as practitioners and our clients' perspectives quite a bit. In that, when we're dealing with a client who struggles with chronic pain, we always are starting with, how's your pain? What's your pain level? What's your pain like right now? I suggest that you start by having your clients carry around a small journal and notice when the pain is abating, even just a little bit, it's just eased off from an eight to a seven. Oh. How did that bring, what, you know, what's going on right now that your pain is a seven, not an eight? When do you feel a little bit better? And those are the kinks in the armor of pain. And if we can bring attention and, and mindfulness to when the pain is a little bit better, this gives us a lot of information and guidance for which direction to take um, this therapeutic work and relationship with each of our clients. So shifting attention from pain to improvement, to a little more space, a little more ability to breathe, a little more ability to relax, a little less attention on the pain. All right, and then finally, in your first session, or really throughout your sessions, because as I said, this whole thing is a process that, that goes on for months, years, weeks at minimum. What is the patient ready or able to do now? What is her expectation of what she is going to be contributing? Because as, as practitioners, we have to pay attention to when we're wanting this more than them, than our client or patient when we're doing more of the work. Because quite honestly, while we are guides and we are information seekers and we are educators and we are, we are using our therapeutic hands and skills and recommendations, the, the implementation, the work, the steps, the mindset shifts are all going on inside our patients, our clients. 
it is their body that will do the healing work. You know, even if we're using medications, surgeries, we're just creating environments for the body to do more healing work. So, you know, what is her expectation of her work here? What is her commitment? You know, and her commitment is going to wax and wane. There are going to be days that this gets very difficult, just like my commitment waxes and wanes to everything I'm doing in life, right? And that's okay. We support each other through that. Um, accountability. How does she like to show up and continue to do this work collaboratively? What resources and support that does she have? You know, if she has unlimited financial resources and 20 people, you know, in her home ready to help her, that may, may or may not be easier than someone who is living on food stamps and has very few close supportive relationships. And we need to be meeting people where they are and, you know, recognizing that everyone's journey is unique. And then we begin with the, you know, in each session. Now, again, this assessment information gathering is always happening in this rather systematic way, really. It's just that, you know, over time we begin to take things all off the list that need to be addressed, but set the expectation that this is potentially going to take some time. Sometimes it happens pretty quickly, but very often, you know, if this client has been struggling for several years, it may take several months to a year or two to bring the pain level to something that is much more manageable. So baby steps, where is the client's priority area of concern? Where does she have the, have the resources to begin? And then working with the long game mindset. So remember, walking through these steps happens in the assessment appointment, but it also happens over months and years of collaborative support, meeting by meeting by meeting, peeling the layers, peeling the layers, peeling the layers, gathering more trust. As you hold space each time, the clients maybe fill in things that they didn't have the trust in you yet to give you at first. Um, you'll be developing a team with her together. Other things she may be talking about with her psychotherapist, with her nutritionist, with her acupuncturist, with her physician, with her surgeon, depends on her team and where you're a part on the team. So this is a systematic process. It's a long game mindset and it starts with shifting awareness from pain to when is the pain just a little bit better? Let's bring attention to that. That's the kink in the armor. What can shift? Maybe does better sleep help, better nutrition, different movement, different medications, different manual therapies, different mitochondrial support supplements. Each individual woman's healing recipe or man's healing recipe is distinct and unique and we take time to pull it all together, knowing that this is a process, a relationship and a journey, not a one and done treatment, not even a five and done treatment a lot of times or 10 and done treatment. It just very much depends on, you know, the long-term history and how many things are involved. And again, focus on the client's priority area of concern. If we can move the needle on the thing that is bothering her the most collaboratively and empower her to have the tools to move that needle, not be dependent on you to do it, that's the best first start. All right, enjoy your day. We'll continue this conversation in the comments below. Thank you so much for your time and your commitment to taking great care of men and women everywhere with chronic pelvic and other pain conditions. Bye.